Fantastic. So as you've seen here at Tel Aviv University, at the ICRC Center, we try to outdo ourselves every year. This year, I'm proud to tell you, it's our biggest event yet, with the most side sessions happening, with a hacker community-oriented event on Wednesdays, the first ever B-sides, security B-sides in Israel. We have events from all kinds of industries, sessions with uh, YATA, International Association, and lots of other sessions. So I'm sure there is something from ev for everybody. As a per personally, as a senior researcher at the center, I've had the opportunity in the past year to meet some incredible bleeding edge thinkers who all come here to Tel Aviv, Israel, to learn about the future of cybersecurity, to learn about the innovative ecosystem we have here, and to understand what is the Israeli secret sauce that helps us become leaders in this global industry. Today we have really interesting sessions lined up, and I'm proud to say I think this year our lineup is more impressive than ever before. And we're about to hear from some of the leading thinkers on an issue that I think is important to every nation in the world, critical infrastructure protection. And to do that, it is my personal honor to invite a friend and an author that I incredibly respect and admire, Kim Zetter an award-winning journalist from Wired magazine. Let me tell you something. Kim literally wrote the book about Stuxnet. Her recent book called Countdown Zero Day unravels the mystery behind the Stuxnet event, which I think we can all say is the cyber history moment of 2010, the year where we all woke up into a new reality of cyber warfare. Kim is not only an investigative journalist, she's also been covering computer security since 1999, first for PC World and now for Wired magazine. Her stories about cybersecurity have often broken news and scoops that nobody else knew about for the past decade and more, and she is respected by her peers and journalists all over the world. Kim, like I said, recently completed the book about Stuxnet, and I'm very excited to hear her insights and the insights of her panel of experts from all over the world that are joining us here today to talk about this issue of critical infrastructures. Please help me by welcoming Kim to our stage today. Like, sit down. Thanks. So I actually started my journalism career in Israel uh, many years ago. Uh, so it's been a bit of full circle for me to now uh, do the book on Stuxnet, um, which was, of course, about a operation that was rumored to be conducted by two countries, Israel and the U.S. Um, I wanted to just talk briefly for a second here about uh, something that uh, Professor Itzhak Ben Israel said yesterday, I was at the China-Israel panel, and he talked about uh, Stuxnet breaking three paradigms. And the first paradigm he said it, it broke, the, uh, the myth was that um, cyber attacks were only about information, about stealing information, degrading information, changing information, preventing access to information. And Stuxnet, of course, was not about even uh, causing damage to the systems that it infected, but was about jumping from the digital realm to the physical realm and causing physical destruction of systems that the computers controlled. So that was the first uh, major change uh, that Stuxnet brought. The second paradigm that uh, Stuxnet broke was uh, the idea um, that every, the idea of what we, what we think of as a computer. So I've been covering cybersecurity since 1999 and control systems were never on my radar. They should have been, um, but I think most of the security community outside of a small niche of people who uh, are in, who are experts in control system security, industrial control systems, weren't really focused on these as computers, things like pro programmable logic controllers, remote terminal units. So this was a whole new area that was opened not only to us, but now the hacker world as well uh, got introduced to these systems. 
So the other, um, the other paradigm that Stuxnet broke was the idea that only systems that are connected to the internet uh, were targets of attack. Now this wasn't a surprise for people who work in cyber cybersecurity. Um, obviously, uh, there had been attacks uh, or infections, let's say, done through USB sticks in the past. But primarily the focus was on systems getting infected and attacked over the internet, over some kind of connectivity, uh, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. And so this really uh, made it clear to everyone that systems that are heavily secured and guarded behind even uh, uh, you know, um, anti-aircraft uh, systems, anti-aircraft guns, uh, could be uh, accessed well, with the di digital attack. So uh, now I wanted to, uh, I mean, so Stuxnet was, you know, the first attack that we know of that, that leapt from the digital realm to the physical realm to cause physical destruction. But it wasn't the first one that actually occurred. There was a proof of concept attack uh, that was conducted by some researchers in 2007 called the Aurora Generator Test. I just want to see how many people know what the Aurora Generator Test is. So not that many hands. So I'm going to give you just a brief description of what it did, because this will uh, give you an idea of what we're talking about when we're talking about potential attacks on critical infrastructure. So the, I don't know if you want to just uh, not play the video, but can you show the still image from the video? No, no, don't play it. Yet. Oops, sorry. So, uh, so this was a 27 ton generator retired from the uh, oil fields in Alaska. And this was a test done at the Idaho National Lab, a government lab, uh, and it was, the premise was some researchers started wondering, would it be possible to cause physical destruction with nothing more than digital code? Would it be possible for remote hackers in, let's say, Russia, uh, North Korea, China, to send digital code that could leap from the digital realm uh, to cause physical destruction? And so the result of that question was what's called the Aurora Generator Test. And the Aurora Generator Test was uh, targeting uh, what something's called a, a protective relay. The protective relay on the grid is designed to detect when systems are getting into a dangerous zone. So the grid in the US operates at 60 hertz and all of the equipment that's connected to the grid has to be operating at 60 hertz. Otherwise, it can cause damage to the grid or things like the generator that are connected to the grid can be damaged. So the protective relay is designed to detect when something like a generator is getting out of sync uh, with the grid. And if it does, if the generator, the frequency increases, what the protective relay will do is it will trigger the breaker to open and disconnect that generator from the grid. So what the attack was designed to do, it was just 21 lines of code, it was designed to subvert the protective relay and trick the, the protective relay into thinking that an out of sync condition was actually a healthy, appropriate condition. And so instead of opening the breaker, the protective relay would actually close the breaker when the generator was out of sync. So the attack that they designed, the 21 lines of code, was actually a, a cyclical attack. What it did was it caused the uh, protective relay to open the breaker first, and when the, protective, when the breaker opened, the generator then would, would speed up. The frequency would increase because there was no pushback from the grid against it. And then what would happen is the protective relay, the code would tell the protective relay, close now even though it's out of sync. And then it would open, and the, the generator would speed up again, more frequency, close, open, close. And so you'll see now uh, what that looked like in the attack. Can you play the video? So that took three minutes to destroy the 27-ton generator. They could have accomplished it in just 15 seconds, but the engineers built in some pauses into the attack so that after each time the uh, generator got it reattached to the grid, the safety engineers would be able to check that everything is okay. So what's happening there is the generator is producing too much energy, uh, it hits the grid, 
uh, and it comes back and attacks the generator. So that was one kind of attack causing physical destruction. Now I'm going to show you uh, just briefly a GIF of an attack that uh, was another proof of concept that was done at the DEF CON Hacker Conference last year. And this one involved a barrel, it's a 50 gallon barrel. And the idea was uh, that this would be possible kind of attack that could be conducted against a chemical plant. So I don't know if you want to pull up that GIF and I can explain what it is. It's just in a loop there, but what, what you're seeing here is, this is Jason Larson, he's a former uh, worker at the Idaho National Lab, and the attack that he designed was uh, it would um, it, it's vacuum packed the barrel simultaneously while it increased the heat inside the barrel. And you can see the sort of the shock wave in the room as a result when the barrel collapsed there. So the idea is you could design an attack like this that uh, destroys barrels in a chemical plant and causes a chemical spill. And of course, if you have uh, multiple barrels that you can uh, destroy like this, you might have some kind of uh, chemical mix inside of a plant that would cause a toxic uh, chain reaction. So those are sort of two kinds of physical attacks. Um, that's just sort of setting the stage for our panel now. So I want to introduce you now to our four panelists and maybe each of them can come up on the stage while I introduce them. So the first panel, panelist is uh, Richard Puckett. He's the Senior Director uh, of Security Operations and Cyber Intelligence at General Electric. And he's also just uh, started a new position there as the uh, head of um, all product and commercial security programs. Prior to that, he was at Cisco, where he led security architecture and design for enterprise, customer, and federal programs. Richard? Uh, we also have Mark Gazit, who is CEO of ThetaRay, which is a big data analytics firm in Israel. Prior to that, he was managing director of NICE Cyber and Intelligence Solutions, a division of NICE, and he's also the former CEO and co-founder of SkyVision, a global telecommunications company. <laughs> We have uh, Terry Roberts, who is founder and president of Whitehawk, which helps companies uh, determine what are the best cybersecurity solutions for them. Prior to that, she was the former executive director at Carnegie Mellon's uh, Software Engineering Institute, and she was also deputy director of Naval Intelligence, where she helped lead the Navy's intelligence and information warfare teams. And we have Dmitry Kuznetsov, who is chief scientist at the National Nuclear Security Administration, which oversees the security of nuclear materials, nuclear weapons. Uh, and he also serves as an advisor to the Secretary of Energy. So please welcome the panel. So I wanted to start our discussion with uh, a question about Stuxnet, because uh, after Stuxnet was discovered in 2010, everyone in the security community, particularly Ralph Langner, who was one of the researchers who helped take apart Stuxnet, had predicted that we were going to see a lot of copycat attacks. And we haven't. I mean, other than, and this wasn't a copycat of Stuxnet, but other than the recent um, blackout in Ukraine, we haven't really seen attacks on critical infrastructure that uh, have caused any uh, sort of real effects. Um, so I guess the question is, uh, why haven't we seen them? And is there a real threat? Or uh, is it really still theoretical? And anyone can take the question. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, shall I start with it? Go ahead. So the question was why we don't see a lot of uh, sort of Stuxnet-like attacks uh, on critical infrastructure, right? And um, first of all, and uh, uh, Richard definitely has a... Uh, more deeper view on the United States. But first of all, attacks do happen. The only difference between uh, organizations like Facebook uh, or Google, if somebody takes them down, it's evident to everybody. In most of the cases where there is, there is an attack of critical infrastructure, what uh, average user will see is just a, it's an outage. And uh, in most of the cases, it will not, not be published as a critical infrastructure attack, which I believe, by the way, is rightly so, because you don't want to hint the hackers and say that they are successful. So it, in most of the cases, it will be identified as a mail function. And uh, so this is one reason. Another reason, and I will talk more about it, 
is that it's extremely difficult to identify. Since you wrote a book about, cyber, about Stuxnet, basically Stuxnet wasn't about breaking into, it wasn't about viruses and network security. It was about changing the speed of the centrifuges. So to identify such an attack, you actually need to analyze the speed, the velocity, the pressure of the centrifuges, uh, which most of the organizations uh, uh, cannot do or cannot identify as cybersecurity attack. So to summarize, in some cases it happens and they don't disclose it, in some cases it happens and they don't know that it happened to them. So, I, I, sorry to interrupt you, I just realized uh, that I was actually going to ask each of you to speak for five minutes before we started on the questions. So, my apologies. Let's, uh, let's start that now and then we'll go into the... Go ahead, Richard. Yeah, th so, th so each of them had a, a topic that they were going to discuss for about five minutes and then we were going to go into questions. We sort of changed the structure of the panel and that threw me off. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so, I, I, you're, you know, the question is a good lead-in, I guess, to the topic in general, which is um, about really critical infrastructure itself. Uh, when you think about um, the systems and services that provide critical infrastructure, we're really talking about, we, we talk about the grid a lot, but critical infrastructure is comprised of a lot of different areas. Uh, that's, you know, when we think about health and emergency services, when we think about water purification, um, hospital uh, environments. You know, the critical infrastructure is a domain, so these domains are defined today. And what it takes to both attack them and defend them, and the consequences associated with them are somewhat different than what you see in your traditional IT spaces. Mark had it right when you, you think about when an IT system is taken offline. Sometimes the consequence of that is a, a loss of your information, uh, maybe an exposure of your banking credentials, and the recovery states that occur as a result of that are well path, uh, well defined. Um, you know, you think about banks, if your banking credentials have been compromised or your credit card exposed, uh, they tend to issue you a new card very quickly. Uh, the, the debt is erased from your account and you're back in, in, in operation. In, in critical infrastructure, we think a lot about the consequences, and that's really what I wanted to speak about briefly, which is when we think about the consequences of a failure, uh, whether that's the, the kinetic incident that can occur, as Mark mentioned, about a, a system going offline, uh, it's, it's very visceral. Sometimes it's a loss of power into a home, uh, sometimes it's, a, it's an impedance of emergency services, the loss of connectivity for your cell phone, you name it. So I think those are the things when we think about design and defending critical infrastructure, these are the biggest issues that, that are pressing us today. Um, think about legacy in software. And I know many of you in the, in the room are probably developers of software. Um, we, we tend to uh, talk about the legacy issues of Microsoft quite a bit and how they have to have all this backward compatibility and how difficult it is to create new platforms. And they, they have a terrible problem, a very challenging problem I appreciate because people have yet to see how difficult it's going to be to advance in some of these new domains of critical infrastructure while bringing along the long tail of legacy. The generator video you show was, showed was a 25-year-old generator. How old was the generator? Was it on I'm not sure how old it was. It was yeah. a 27 ton generator. It only ton. recently retired. Recently that. retired. So there's equipment in the power grid today that can be 30 or 40 years old. And at the time when it was deployed and designed, it was never intended to be cross connected or connected to the internet, whether directly or indirectly. And so these environments uh, come with a, a legacy issue that we have to figure out how to navigate as we're creating these new capabilities uh, in critical infrastructure to either optimize to actually try to make them safer, which is a really big design component for us, that, that safety and reliability story that we're trying to address. And then also, how are we going to make them interoperate? Because the newer systems that we bring to bear can have all the great security features, but to make them interoperable with legacy sometimes means a downgrade of security, which is uh, often a big challenge. And if you take the example that was given around Stuxnet, uh, it was actually taking advantage of not only what the centrifuges were doing, but also the clear text protocols that made it easy for a man in the middle of the attack to work. So you have to think about those things in the ecosystem you're defending in critical infrastructure. And that's a huge part of the story today. And, and that's why being in Israel on this topic is a good topic to bring forward because in that disruptive trend as we're moving towards really more software introduction uh, in, in our company, we talk about where big iron meets big, big data. 
where the software bridges that chasm between the two, there's a ton of innovation that's needed to help defend these environments. And that's not only when we're bringing these new things to bear, but also as we're thinking about cross-connecting legacy. I just, I'm glad you brought up, uh, you broadened the, our definition of critical infrastructure. Yeah. Um, in the U.S., we have 16 different sectors that the government defines as critical infrastructure. And I don't think that anyone would have expected that Sony is considered in critical infrastructure by the government. We all discovered that after Sony got hacked, that they do actually fall into a category as motion picture companies. Um, so who knew? Yeah. Anyways, on Mark. Uh, <clears throat> Great, thank you very much. And I will follow up on what Richard said about Stuxnet. Just for the record, we Israelis, so the only thing we know about Stuxnet, it came from your book, right? So, uh, because we read your book and that's how we learned about this uh, phenomena. Uh, but if you think about Stuxnet and uh, as such, basically we're dealing with something that is totally transformational. It's a world of unknown unknowns. Uh, if allegedly governments did it, then basically you can't use antiviruses anymore because it's zero-day attack. It didn't exist before. You can't use firewalls because according to your book, it was in Boucher, which is a power reactor was in South Mountain. So like you don't have firewall logs at all. So suddenly you need to analyze a new breed of information that you've never seen before. And the problem is that the amount of information becoming like enormous. You can't analyze it anymore. Uh, General Electric introduced uh, Predix Cloud, which connects all the devices, but suddenly you can't even digest the information. With the work with airline companies, one flight of 787, uh, airplane in 30 minutes create two terabytes of data, which is like 400 uh, libraries of Congress. You need to analyze it in real time to identify cybersecurity attacks such as Taxnet. Uh, so what do you do? How do you, uh, how do you deal with it when existing solutions based on rules and patterns, etc., don't work because you don't have any uh, existing and uh, previous knowledge? So you sort of need to find this uh, needle in a haystack, in a haystack and I love what you said about critical infrastructure. Because let me give you one example, which is the true, real example that we face. Uh, ATMs. ATM is just uh, an SCADA device. For those of you who don't know how ATM is built, it's very similar to a, a nuclear facility in uh, Iran because it's basically a computer running Windows XP and a few motors that get SCADA commands. And historically, if you wanted to steal money from ATM, you had to use those fake credit cards or skimming devices. But today, you break into the backbone of the ATM, you send SCADA command to the motor that starts to spin, then you send another SCADA command to the actuator that opens the door, and then you see very interesting phenomena uh, that the money coming out of the wall. All you need is what they call money mules, a lot of criminals that will collect the money, and by the way, it's, it's a real thing that happened. Now, it doesn't sound critical, but if we talk about a country in Latin America with 6,700 6, ATMs, and all of them were hacked at the same time, that's, that becomes a public unrest issue. And you need to identify it, you need to discover it. Uh, now I have to tell you that uh, we do believe that uh, there are good news because with the advanced advancement of uh, uh, cybersecurity attacks and with an ability of hackers actually to uh, uh, use or abuse machines, as you know, today, if you want to uh, conduct an attack, you need three or four people that will use bots to take over 100 million computers, and then they will use those computers to conduct an attack. The good news is that those computers can also help us when you have the right algorithms, when you know how to look for these uh, unknown unknowns. And I'm sorry that sounds like Rumsfeld, you know, I don't take sides. Um, and then we strongly believe that is in this new world, where you don't really looking for a needle in a haystack. You're looking for a needle in a needle stack because they all look the same. But one of them is different. Uh, human beings are not qualified enough to identify those attacks. Luckily, we do have machines and we believe that with clouds like Predix, with analytic machines that can identify those attacks in real time and alert people, uh, at the end of the day, this game or this movie is a happy end movie. Uh, history shows that uh, good guys win eventually. Bad guys move faster, but good guys win. So that's my message. I'm good. So I'd like to go back to your question, Kim, because I think it actually leads nicely into my opening thoughts. Um, when I put my, you know, I come at this from a former national security professional, current cyber intelligence professional, and just because something hasn't been done again doesn't mean it isn't planned, that there aren't 
targeting folders available, right? That, that this isn't something that both state actors or hacktivist groups don't have ongoing. So I always believe in the worst, right? And that we should be preparing for the worst and that we should take this area really seriously because what happened uh, when we weaponized software to be able to get to critical systems, right? It became both a safety issue um, and a warfare issue at the same time. Um, the, the other remarks that I wanted to bring up is really about um, how we should think about it and how we should be problem solvers uh, regarding this important area. Um, I think one of the areas, without getting into too much detail, is I, I think it's more less information sharing and more cyber threat intelligence sharing. Um, I think it needs to be done in this arena, within the sectors, at the next level up. I think it needs to be done across countries because this is not something that's limited to one or two countries. It's everybody is impacted who has these critical systems. Um, and so we're all at risk. And so anything that we can do to raise the bar in automated sharing, um, analytic sharing, and campaign sharing, we need to be doing today. And, and then the final thing I'd like to say is, I meet with two to three incredibly innovative cybersecurity companies every week as a part of my business. And there are some great asymmetric approaches to critical infrastructure vulnerabilities today. Um, there are Israeli companies, German companies, US companies. Some of them are creating um, encrypted techniques for the control systems. Others are putting in place um, uh, new approaches to capture, right, the adversary as they come into your system. Um, others are doing assessments so that you can fine tune where are your critical vulnerabilities. So we need more companies, more innovation, more research focused on this space. So. We'll try this one. So uh, thank you, Kim. Uh, I wanted to just give you a little context about how we think about uh, the energy critical infrastructure control systems uh, at the Department of Energy. And uh, we have to step back and think about cybersecurity in a much broader context. What the Department of Energy is, is an interesting collection of uh, authorities, responsibilities, and capabilities uh, that really converge on complex systems and enterprises. Uh, you know, we start at one end uh, with power management administration. So we own transmission wires for maybe 10% of the country's uh, electrical transmission, uh, largely tied to hydroelectric power. Uh, we are, uh, the, the Federal Energy Regulatory uh, Commission is part of the Department of Energy, which does regulation uh, in the sector. Uh, under that, uh, we are the uh, identified uh, department uh, that, uh, for, that is responsible for the energy critical infrastructure in the United States. And the tool set we have uh, includes the, the nice video that Kim showed on the Aurora test at Idaho National Laboratory, one of our laboratories, which was back in 2007, uh, and kind of uh, typifies the things that we do. The department has a workforce of almost 100,000 scientists and engineers and technicians spread around the country, largely at 17 national laboratories, that includes Idaho as well as Livermore, Los Alamos, Sandia, Oak Ridge, collections of places uh, where we cultivate expertise in broad sets of missions uh, that facilitate a lot of crosstalk. And it allows us to attack very complex problems. And we're typically an agency 
that uh, partners across government uh, and internationally uh, to bring the tools we have and the facilities we have to bear on problems of national and international interest. Uh, I think this, this goes as one of those types of problems. Uh, in addition to our sites, we have test sites, uh, large areas where we have rigid uh, power grids, where we have control over the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, where we can test things to failure. And it's an interesting place uh, Nevada test site, about 1,400 square miles of space, uh, and Idaho has just under 1,000 square miles. But we have uh, facilities like that, which are also interesting places to start asking uh, tougher questions about control systems, about networks, about crosstalk, uh, cyber, uh, wireless, and intersections of technologies co that can impact uh, the, the grid. And so as we think about cyber, we typically draw upon the tools that we have at our disposal and try and look at it in, the, in a broader sense. So I want to I wanna, um, get to uh, sort of uh, solutions of what we should be doing in a second. But I wanted to ask um, all of you, first of all, we have very few test cases to be examining in terms of uh, attacks on critical infrastructure. Stuxnet, the Ukraine attack, um, there was this reported attack against the Turkish pipeline, although there's a lot of dispute about whether that was actually a cyber attack. Um, so I'm wondering, are there, are there other incidents out there that are happening that just aren't getting publicized? Are there things that you guys know about that you want to share? <laughs> I think this is an attack on critical infrastructure right here. <laughs> <laughs> so you're asking two questions, kind of very interesting ones. And let it, look at look at it through the lens of I think two ways to think about it. Maybe one on the nation state tier. Uh, if you think about the recent announcement with Dust Storm, if you saw that on the attacks on Japan critical infrastructure, uh, a company called Silence actually uncovered that, and it was very interesting because it was a five-year campaign of attacks uh, on broad, re broad reaching. They used a wide range of attacks as well, everything from phishing, targeted attacks, and spear phishing, all the way down to sort of zero day flash and uh, IE exploits. Uh, so you, you have to look at it from the standpoint and the objective of a nation state and what they may be targeting. Uh, so Stux is, I think we, we tend to talk a lot about Stux and it, it was a watershed event in terms of visibility. Uh, but then you look at some of the recent discoveries around Flame, Dooku, Gauss, uh, Shamoon that hit Saudi Aramco, and uh, some of those were our customers. And the outages were quite severe if you think about what the objective was, what they were after. Uh, so at the nation state level, uh, and, and we can talk about Tbilisi as well, uh, because that might have been actually about energy politics in the region, the, the speculation that that was the cause of it. So at the nation state tier, we can even look at what happened between Russia and Georgia. Uh, 72 hours before Russia invaded Georgia, it was all cyber. Everything from banking to telecommunications to create disruption. And we think about the cyber warfare as the fifth dimension of warfare now, land, sea, air, space, cyber, with cyber becoming an, a doctrine of warfare and political tool of nations. Below that are the cyber criminal world. Uh, and that can be hacktivists, that can be insiders, uh, that can be non-state actor groups, uh, and at their disposal where the two meet is a very interesting world uh, in the underground economy, um, where you're even seeing the more uh, pedestrian forms of attack, uh, ransomware, crypto wall, locky, uh, uh, I can give you, a, gosh, any number of ransomwares that are hitting hospitals today, and, and with, with very effective means. They're, the hospitals are paying because their impatient records are being encrypted. MedStar was hit, Hollywood Presbyterian, I can give you a laundry list of companies. But who, who in the room can tell me what's the most effective piece of malware across all critical infrastructure today? What's the one that's created some of the most disruption uh, at, at the most generic level of HMI and SCADA? Ah, it's the squirrels, yes. No, it, it, you're actually right uh, from physical, but uh, Conficker, you know, the common cold of the internet. Why? Because legacy infrastructure has mm -hmm. uh, Windows CC, XP, mm -hmm. Windows 95 embedded. It can hit things, as Mark mentioned, ATMs uh, without defenses. And it actually does create 
forms of disruption that may not make the public eye, but they are things that need to be remediated. So. Thank you. Actually, I wanted to answer your question, but I didn't have a mic. <laughs> but Karen did it, so. <laughs> uh, but you know, it's really, it's really an interesting world. Uh, should I give the example about the uh, dam in Russia? Is it like public oh, domain? Sayana. Sayana? Yeah. yeah. Shall we go for it? Go ahead. Okay. So, you know, and it's a question of uh, attribution. Is it a cybersecurity attack or not? I encourage you, because now it's public, it wasn't very public, to try to type uh, Sachana Yevskaya Dam in Russia. Now, Richard knows this story just much better than I do, uh, but it's a very nice uh, dam uh, that basically has a, a turbine. It's a two-ton turbine, very different from centrifuges in, uh, uh, in Iran. And there was a computer that was supposed to deal with vibrations. And uh, as far as we know, somebody broke into that computer. No. No, you'll tell more. Uh, but basically, uh, this computer stopped detecting vibrations, and what happened is harmonic movements, and then you have a two-ton rotating machine came out of the pit and uh, destroyed the entire dam. Now, is it uh, attributed to cybersecurity attack? Is it something else? We don't know, but luckily for us, Russians actually sometimes would like to, my personal belief, would like to make some noise. So how many of you are familiar with black energy, Ukraine, what happened in Ukraine? <laughs> I don't see many hands. Okay. So first of all, uh, when Russians tried to take over Crimea, they had to shut down uh, communication of the Thailand. Everybody in the world knew what happened, what is happening. Ukrainians in Crimea didn't know because the uh, fiber uh, links were down. Actually, they were not down. There was something called BGP attack. The traffic was just rerouted to Russia, and it didn't work. Then later on, Russians decided uh, to, allegedly Russians decided, and we know all from Kim's books and the articles, to uh, mm. shut down the power system. Mm. And we know what happened. We know that they uh, uh, actually took over the computers, we using command and control computers shut down the uh, or sent commands to shut down substations. They also dealt with the UPS. They changed uh, Ethernet to serial controllers because, you, as Richard said, some of those machines don't even speak modern protocols. They speak something called serial protocol. So you need to uh, deal with those converters to make sure that you take the system down. Now, in this case, we know that operators saw the mouse cursor moving on the screen and pushing buttons and they were just helpless. Now, my personal belief is it happened because Russians wanted everybody to know that they did it because they could just shut down the system without making the cursor move on the screen. So I believe that one of those examples, because somebody wanted to show off and see that they can do it, we actually have evidence of a disaster happened. But how many cases Attackers didn't want to move the cursor. They just shut down the subsystems and it was classified as a yet another malfunction. So uh, there are many bad things about uh, wars and uh, uh, the crisis between Russia and Ukraine, but one good thing is that we could witness uh, cyber warfare in action when I believe one part uh, wanted uh, to be discovered and to sort of uh, threaten the other part. Actually, Ukraine was the one that I was going to mention. Um, but the only thing that I would say is uh, it, the, it's the combination. So if you were to shut down power in the Northeast power grid in the United States, you know, for 12 to 48 hours, but then you also combined it with other activities, right. and then your ability to respond, your ability to coordinate communications, your ability to help people, you know, that's, that's when I think it gets scary and why this is so critical. Right. I, so there was, um, I wanted to bring that up, there was a report that came out in the U.S. in 2000, I think it was 14, um, where it looked at what it would take to bring down uh, the, the grid nationwide. And the report indicated that if you could take out nine key transmission substations out of the 55 um, that exist in the U.S., those nine key uh, could cause a nationwide back blackout. Um, possibly, 
uh, for the duration of weeks, maybe months. Um, and then there was also the, the idea that, you, I mean, so you can take things down, but you also, I mean, if you're destroying equipment like the generator, a generator, that was a 27 ton generator that maybe would be used at a hospital. But if you're talking about the generators mm -hmm. that are on the grid, these are generators that are custom built and can take a year or longer to mm -hmm. build again. Mm -hmm. So if you can take out, destroy those generators, that's why the length of time um, to get a system back up uh, would be so long. But I'm wondering, and maybe Dimitri, you can help us understand the <laughs> grid's resiliency. And we, I'm, you know, we're talking primarily about the U.S., but I'm assuming that the same problems are nationwide, or sorry, globally. Um, is it possible to cause a nationwide blackout um, by taking out key substations like that, a handful? So I, it, it's a great question. I, the way we approach uh, complex problems like that, and there are many of them in the department, is through uh, simulation. Uh, we, we really virtualize many of these uh, and we try and apply a rigorous uncertainty quantification approach uh, so that the outcomes that we that come from these complex predictions are bracketed with uncertainty um, and so uh, whether it's in our, our nuclear weapons program or other national security programs there there is a fairly deep and rigorous process for doing simulation and what we mean by trying to answer a complex question like that for this one I, I'm really not aware of a, a model of that caliber that has a detailed description of the U.S. grid uh, that could answer with some uh, real accuracy uh, that question. I, I, I haven't seen anyone uh, who has done that. We, we try and, and look at cyber issues uh, by modeling complex enterprises on some of our largest supercomputers. Uh, modeling parts of the web to try and understand what kind of failures can, can percolate through. Uh, that's already hard. Doing the grid, I, I have not seen done in a rigorous way that you could base policy decisions on. Um, so the other question that I had for the panelists is, uh, you know, we, we looked at um, what Stuxnet did uh, and we looked at uh, the, um, the Ukrainian I, Mark, did you mention the firmware upgrades on the? I didn't. It's one, it was the firmware upgrade. So when when the when the attack uh, targeted the uh, Ukraine uh, power distribution centers, they took down. They opened. They basically they opened the breakers, but to prevent the systems from being back up, uh, being brought back up remotely, um, they actually overwrote the firmware on the remote terminal units that were out in the field. So the operators couldn't uh, restore, basically just close the breakers remotely. They had to actually send people out into the field to physically close those breakers. And in the US, my understanding is that, I mean, that, so that you have that manual capability in Ukraine and you don't have that manual capability in the US or it's quickly being eroded. So when you're uh, automating systems, it's going to be much more difficult to, to bring them back up. So my question then is, like, what are your, um, what are the biggest things that you are concerned about uh, in terms of things that you're seeing out there? I mean, so I have two, and one is the firmware issue, uh, that the, the firmware on these devices is not secured, um, and so it can be overwritten. And my other concern is uh, related to an attack that we saw in 2012 against a Canadian company called Telvent. And this was an attack uh, where the, um, the hackers got into, Telvent is basically a third party uh, control system monitoring and installer. Um, they have customers, they install control systems in, in the plants and then they monitor them. And if you can get into, the attackers got into um, the program files and if you can get into those files and introduce your malicious code there, it's going to get introduced to those clients through a trusted party, that third party. And that's exactly what happened with Stuxnet. Stuxnet uh, was targeted on contractors who worked at the, the facility at Natanz, and they carried Stuxnet into that facility. So um, what are your scenarios, Lev? What do you consider, consider the most serious Um, I have to say that uh, we do have a concern and basically um, 
the concern is not necessarily about that specific technology, whether it's firmware or whether it's financial institutions. Software written in COBOL, which was like uh, 40, 50 years ago, and some people wrote this software not with us anymore. Uh, the concern is actually the availability of tools. Uh, since Richard, you ask a question, I also ask a question. How many uh, of you know what is Nobus and no UBS? It's uh, nobody but US, right? And base nobody. Nobody does. So basically, if we are in a send, we know how to get hacked to a system, nobody else will find out. And uh, we are a government, so we can identify great vulnerabilities. Now, it's not necessarily about the United States, it's about uh, any other government. The problem is that there's a leakage of those technologies to the, criminal, to the hands of criminal. And I think we, have, we witnessed a great example, a sad example about a company called Hacking Team. They created amazing technologies that uh, all the three-letter agencies all around the world were using, FBI, CIA, you name it. And basically it allowed them to um, um, sort of uh, affect any uh, mobile phone, activate camera, voice, etc. The problem is that somebody broke into that uh, organization. You can go to Wikileaks. Unfortunately, you'll find my name there as well. Um, and you can see that the, that hacker that broke into that system made all those tools public available to everybody. It's almost like a, a truck full with RPG missiles suddenly fell at the side of the road and every criminal, every terrorist can get those tools. And we're talking about cyber warfare tools. So this is my bigger concern. Actually, I have to say that's why I established Tetere, uh, because we believe that uh, today um, uh, crime becomes, uh, becomes to pay, pay off. It's, it becomes a very profitable uh, opportunity because they take those uh, vulnerabilities discovered by government sometimes. Uh, you uh, uh, take over uh, hundreds of millions of computers. You make some money, sometimes big money, and nobody can catch you. Nobody can even attribute it to you. And I think those guys really make in the world an, as a, a, an unstable uh, place and I think we all uh, need to join hands and to make sure that we will fight very hard to make world a much safer place. I, I think I'm most concerned about countries having their act together in this space. So in late 2014, the US put out the Presidential Div Directive 21. Um, and it's online on the homepage, you can read all of it. But it, it basically was talking about interagency roles and missions in this space and who's responsible for what and putting that in place and are we communicating effectively across the government and with industry because if we can't prevent it and I'm not saying that we can't um, but then you have to be able to as very effectively respond and mitigate and you can't do that if you don't have all those lines of authority and communications and policies um, and and threat intelligence sharing at speed so I think it's all of our respective nations getting their act together and working with industry to have those frameworks in place so I guess I'm less worried about the kinds of problems that have to do with better hygiene in terms of you know, your upgrades, maintaining your system, reporting information, things that we do that we have lots of companies, lots of people thinking about, and there is a churn in this space and certainly a lot of intellectual horsepower trying to refine it and making better for today's problem. You know, in DOE, we kind of look at some of the more complex problems, and I guess what, what I worry about is uh, typical of any complex engineered system, uh, like the grid, uh, are things that can happen to it. The, the problems that, uh, you know, eventually happen and you say, wow, you know, I, I didn't think that could happen, or, mm -hmm. you know, what just happened? And those are the kinds of things uh, which are perhaps subtle interactions between components that are just beyond any individual's grasp to see the entire complexity of the system, where you have to develop t tools you can trust to make those kind of inquiries. And I, I just don't think we're, we're adequately uh, thinking about that class of problem. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just sit at great answers, by the way. I, I think it's that we're in a race condition that's not going to stop. In fact, mm -hmm. it's probably going to accelerate. And, and I think um, there are the accessibility of, if you, if you take what Dr. Matanya said at the opening of this session today, 
he said, look backwards five years and where we've come from. And if you, you mentioned DEF CON earlier. Uh, five years ago, there weren't even, IOT and ICS weren't even on the agenda of your mm -hmm. mainstream hacking and penetration testing researcher conferences now. There are whole conferences dedicated to it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there's this race condition of the, the, the positive side of exposing these vulnerabilities for correction to make sure that they are keeping these things safe. And then there's also the, the, the sort of negative side that uh, was referenced also about the yin and yang, where the same exposure of those vulnerabilities in the hands of you know, non-state actors or in the hands of people who are not thoughtful can have very catastrophic consequence if they're not careful or maybe intentionally looking to cause. So I think I, I tend to stray towards the positive and say the race condition is, is in our favor when you have a large community of people like the ones here that can be focused down on creating effective solutions to help improve the problem rather than take advantage of it for destructive mm -hmm. means. All right, uh, we're just about out of time. We didn't even get to our second section of our panel where we wanted to talk about solutions. Um, so that's unfortunate, but maybe someone will discuss that in another panel. Um, so thank you um, all the panelists and join me in um, uh, thanking them for their contributions. So thank you.